Thanks everyone for joining us today. Uh, really happy to have you. It's the uh, beginning of the year. We know this is going to be an interesting uh, licensing challenge uh, uh, with Oracle Java. So let's go over some of the basics and uh, bring everyone up to date. Again, as Daniel mentioned, please feel free to use the questions box. Um, at the end of the session, uh, you can raise your hand and we will uh, unmute you uh, and you can ask your question uh, verbally. Uh, also, uh, for copies of the slides, uh, they won't be sent in the email, but you can send uh, a message to info at bellart.com and we will send you copies of the slides. So let's get started. Just a quick background on Bellarc, uh, about 1,700 customers worldwide, a bit more than that, uh, both in the commercial and government space. You might recognize some names here like Autodesk. They're the uh, largest uh, computer-aided design company in the world. And also many uh, people within the both the federal government um, and the U.S. Department of Defense, uh, Federal Aviation Administration, U.S. Department of State Diplomatic Security. Uh, current one is uh, recent customer is U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. And uh, within the U.S. Department of Defense, uh, the U.S. Air Force runs uh, 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 IT for much of the Pentagon, Bowling and Andrews, and they have been using us for uh, many years. Uh, many have been customers long time, uh, long term, I should say, and uh, two main reasons. One, it's a good product and equally important, we place on servicing our customers. So it's a very, very high priority at Bellarc and all our customers are successful. Uh, customers located in over 40 countries worldwide, a number of interesting patents, uh, one in particular for licensing and, and also relevant to the uh, Oracle Java licensing is automatically finding out the uh, last use times of all the applications. So you don't have to wait a year to find out. People have not been using that uh, Oracle Java that you've got installed. So uh, we'll show you some impacts there. So what are the things that uh, you might consider uh, or need to consider for licensing Oracle? Uh, Java. Um, obviously, you need to know uh, where and how much Java you have installed and where those installations are. Um, now, the real question is, do they require a license? And that's dependent on uh, the versions that you have installed. Um, also, obviously, if Java is bundled, um, then it does not require a license. Um, uh, although, uh, obviously, if it's bundled with Oracle, it does not require a license. If it's bundled with other applications, uh, the uh, publishers of those applications should be uh, required to uh, pay for the uh, Java license. And also, um, there is no license required for personal or uh, developer use. Um, so the real question is, once you've got uh, a, a fair idea of uh, what your installations are, do these installations require a license? You also obviously need to check out, you know, are they being used or can can we repurpose those, uh, uninstall them in other words. Uh, this will really help create a uh, ongoing um, uh, effective license position. And and we, we, we don't mean to say that, you know, this is something you should try to do just once a quarter or once a year. Um, it really should be on an ongoing basis. It should be automated. Uh, you shouldn't have to spend uh, lots of manpower uh, time on this sort of thing. Uh, it can definitely, the tools uh, can definitely help you automate this uh, very effectively. And then make decisions on um, what you're going to use Java for uh, and which versions uh, going forward. Um, as we mentioned here, there are some open source uh, alternatives also. In, in fact, even from, uh, from Oracle, the OpenJDK. Uh, so, which Java versions require a license? Um, pretty straightforward. Um, it, it, this all occurred after 2019, uh, uh, April uh, 2019. So, all versions of Java SE uh, released on or after uh, uh, August, sorry, April 16th, uh, 2019. So, version 8, um, this is 8.0.211 uh, and higher. Uh, none of the 9 or 10 require a license, and then 11 and 12 with these versions uh, and higher, and all new, newer versions, of course. Uh, the exceptions are, as we mentioned before, uh, personal use, development, testing, prototyping, and uh, again, uh, 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 something to really consider um, if it works for you, and we, we've seen many commercial customers go in this direction, is to move to the open JDK uh, source. Uh, so some fairly large uh, developers are uh, 
uh, going in this direction. So that's a, that's another alternative. But first, of course, you need to find out what Java you actually have um, and are using. Uh, these are some of the Oracle products um, that uh, bundle Java. Uh, some are common, some are pretty old, uh, but uh, obviously if you have those products, then uh, the Java uh, installs associated with these products uh, do not require a license uh, from Oracle's point of view. Um, so let's go into the costs. Uh, is this something you should really be concerned about? And it obviously depends on uh, the amount of Java that you have uh, installed uh, and the type. So for the Java SE uh, desktop, uh, and we call it, they're called subscriptions uh, licenses now, which means uh, annual payments, uh, of course. And this runs from uh, uh, $2.50 to $1.25 a month, uh, and it's a, uh, uh, named user plus metric. If you're familiar with uh, Oracle metrics, uh, there's the NUP named user plus metric and there is the processor metric. Uh, the processor metric uh, applies to the uh, Java SE uh, subscription and that runs from uh, 25 to uh, 1250. These are typically on, uh, on servers. And uh, just to show you a bit of an example, if you've got say, only 2,000 users um, of the desktop version uh, that would cost you two dollars a month per user. Um, so we're we're running um, at about uh, oh that should be 40,000. So sorry about that. <laughs> Instead of 48, that should be 40,000. Our fact checking didn't catch that. And then uh, if you're running the server version, say on uh, uh, amounting to 200 processors. Uh, that will cost you uh, $23.75 per month or uh, $57,000 per year. Oh, I take that back. Sorry, it's $2 per month, uh, so times 12, of course. Yeah, 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 my mistake. So that is $48,000 per year. Um, a little bit about the reporting. Um, so this is uh, one of the reports that uh, are automatically created by Bellarc. So you can see here, not uh, the product and the, the versions are automatically picked up. Naturally, we're removing the uh, server names. Uh, this is real data. Um, is a license required? Um, uh, is something that we automatically pick up. Uh, these are PROC licenses. Uh, uh, the, on the desktop, obviously, they would be uh, NUP licenses and uh, the last use dates. So you can see some of these are actually last used uh, more than a couple of years ago. So this is a great opportunity again for um, your uh, uh, IT guys to go through and say, yeah, should we, should we just remove those, uh, those uh, uh, Java SE instances? Uh, so this is all automatically picked up by the Bellarc system. Um, a little bit about Bellarc's approach. We have a system that includes, uh, integrates discovery, normalization, and license position, allows you the right data to do the license optimization. Uh, it's all cloud-based uh, with secure TLS uh, connections uh, between your assets. So your assets can be sitting, uh, sorry, I should go back. The server can be hosted on-prem, can be hosted on your uh, cloud, uh, AWS or Azure. Google Cloud, or could be hosted by Bellarc. Um, the assets uh, are discovered with a client, can be uh, installed or uninstallable, or uh, walk around, we call it. Uh, does about a 10, 15 second scan, creates a very small file, less than 40 K bytes, sends that back to your uh, Bell Managed server, and then the server creates entries in the database, and then web-based reports, similar to what we just looked at. So pretty automated system, can be used on a one-time audit or can be used on a continual basis. It's, it's your option. And this, of course, works across networks. So very short and sweet. Um, uh, please feel free to contact us uh, here. And I see we have a couple of questions. Um, so hold on, let me make this a little bit wider. So uh, let's see, we have a question from uh, Egbert. Uh, software update applet seen in discovery scans. Does this lead to licensing issue? How do you measure NUP versus NU or NU usage? Ken, do you want to answer those? 
Uh, let me start with the last thing I heard about the NUP. Uh, NUP means na named user plus, so it really means just named user. So you're talking about measuring it by the person. So if a person uses it on a computer, then you need a license, one license. Um, the distinction against the processor is the processor, if it's installed on a given computer, you must count the number of processors on the computer. So you might need multiple licenses per computer when it's per processor. But NUP would just be one license on the computer that the user is using it on. Uh, I didn't get the earlier part. Yeah, it's in the questions box. Uh, software update applet seen in discovery stands. Does this lead to licensing issue? Uh, we, uh, yeah, I, I imagine you, you're you uh, looking at FCCM scans that will pick up all the executables, um, Egbert, but uh, Bellarc system does an automatic um, normalization, integration and normalization of that data. So we uh, combine those to make sure that you're only paying for uh, for one Java license, not not multiple uh, Java uh, licenses on that for that individual machine. Hopefully that answered your question. If you like, um, you can raise your hand. We can unmute you, um, Egbert, and you can ask the question. Let me see if I can unmute you. Oops, sorry. Yeah, I think you're un unmuted. So please feel free to ask your questions, um, maybe in a little more detail. Sure, uh, but thanks thanks for um, the responses there. Uh, just a follow-up questions on the on my second questions or uh, second yep. question around NUP and and usage. Um, so if if we're licensed for NUP on a server, is there some sort of an access file that we can use to determine the actual usage as opposed to um, you know a an endpoint based measurement right so if, if it's if if it if it's in if it's uh, if we're licensed let's say one of our server running uh, oracle database right we're mm -hmm. licensed uh, using named user plus how right. do we measure uh, the usage? Yeah. Oh, I uh, see. Yeah. Yeah, when it comes to the server itself that's being accessed by uh, remote users, uh, yeah. there is no, yeah. And presumably those remote users are accessing the database through a third party application that's doing some actual useful work and transmitting oh, okay. reports or forms. Um, there is no automated way. To measure that, that is a, a labor-intensive process where you have to get into the the guts of how your third-party application works and how it's using the Oracle database. Um, and that's one of the reasons that that people recommend that you go with per-processor licensing, mm -hmm. because that measurement difficulty does not exist with per-processor licensing, since in the case of per-processor, it's a technical measurement on the processes on the server. So it can be automated. Um, so you really want to go with the name user only if you're sure that it's a big win on the licensing front and you're willing to do that extra work to correctly calculate your licenses, which, as I said, requires manual investigation or working with the manager of that third-party application. Hmm. It'd be interesting how would, you know, how would the audit uh, people at Oracle, the LMS team would measure in compliance to, right? You, you know, what kind of, would they They be? have, yeah, they have the same problem you do. So their <laughs> typical approach is to say, well, tell me about the, the servers that are accessing this database server gotcha. and which applications they're running. And then they would say, let's send a questionnaire to the managers right. of those applications and have them tell us what's going on. Gotcha. All right, great. Thank you, guys. Thanks for the for the answer. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks for asking. We have a question from Constantine. Um, I would welcome a bit clarification. Did you say that Java versions nine and ten do not require a license? Ken? Yeah. Um, uh, our understanding is that versions nine and ten have not been updated 
since Oracle introduced the new policy. So they've updated version 8 and they've updated version uh, 11 and 12, but 9 and 10, as far as we know, never had new versions. After, so after, the after, after this particular date? Yeah. Okay. If there were new versions on those major versions after that date, then they would be liable also. Constantine, do you want to um, do you want us to unmute you um, and uh, raise your hand? We can raise your hand if you want us to unmute and you can ask more questions. Okay, you're all set. I see Sherry uh, Irwin would like to ask a question, so let's unmute you, Sherry. Welcome. Hi there. Uh, actually, I don't have a question. Um, my mistake. I didn't realize I uh, raised my hand. <laughs> oh yes, you did. You know, this uh, is something you got to watch out for in class, Sherry. You know? <laughs> you're going to be you're going to be called on. <laughs> okay, we have a couple more questions to go here. Uh, hold on. Before we get to Jacobo, I wanted to make sure we've covered the other questions. Uh, Egbert, Ivan. Oh, yes. So we have a question from Ivan Ken. Uh, hello, yeah. about running Java on a server running under VMware. Please explain why Oracle's requesting to license all the cluster. Yeah, um, this actually has nothing whatsoever to do with Java. This is a general Oracle policy about licensing all of their software products. And basically their view is that Oracle requires that you license the physical server that is hosting their software. And their view is that a cluster has the flexibility to run their software on any server inside the cluster. And there's no way to tell that it only ran on one server in the cluster versus all of them. Therefore, you're liable for every server in the cluster because it could run on any server in the cluster. And uh, Oracle makes it clear that in their view, that's not open to discussion. So if you ask why they they do that, the answer is because we said so, according to the reasoning that I just gave. Great, Yvonne, If you want to um, uh, ask a, ask more uh, detail, um, please raise your hand, and we can unmute you. In the meantime, we'll go to Jacobo's question. Welcome, Jacobo. I haven't seen you in a while. <laughs> Uh, if an online banking application requires Java and the app points a user to retrieve the appropriate Java version, must this be paid uh, if the version was released after the new policy? And then the second part of that question is obviously who pays for it, the, the bank or the customer? Yeah, would you like me to answer that? Yeah, please, Ken, go ahead. Yeah, well, the first part is uh, I don't think it matters what got you into the situation of getting an installation of a new version of Java. But if a new version of Java was installed and it's being used, then you, the end user, are liable for a license. Um, as far as whether you or, you know, as you say, the bank or the customer should pay for it, uh, I think that probably comes down to the uh, license or a contract that, that the customer has with the bank as to who's responsible for doing that. Um, uh, now I realize maybe you're thinking about a, a retail situation where you're just a consumer at home and the bank is your personal bank and the bank says use Java in order to access our website, in order to access your account information. Um, I. You know, I'm not positive about this. I haven't looked into this situation, but that might qualify as personal use if you're using it at home for your personal bank account. But, but Oracle, I'm not may, positive may, about that. Oracle may also interpret that as requiring a um, processor license. Uh, so, well, I don't think I, when I, you're I, using it at home, you would try to do that, no. Right, but you're no, you're connected to you're connected to the bank's um, website and oh, application. Right, you're saying they might tell the bank right. banks and you're having an unknown number of users out there. The name User right. Plus is totally inappropriate. Right. 
we want you to use per processor licensing, in which exactly. case you can have an unlimited number of customers use it. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah, knowing Oracle, yeah. that's historically been the case. Jacobo, okay. would you would you like to us to unmute you? And you can ask, um, feel free to raise your hand. No, okay. I think we have think one more question have... from Peter. Oh yes, go ahead. The question is, where can we buy the license? Is there any list of authorized resellers? Uh, yes, there there is a list on Oracle site. Um, we can uh, follow up uh, at the end of the session, Peter, um, and uh, if someone will grab your email address, Daniel, and we can follow up and send you that link. But there is a large list of authorized resellers for uh, Java. And there's also a price sheet, <laughs> so you can get both. All right, any other, other questions? If not, thank you all very, very much for joining us. Uh, if you would like copies of the slides, uh, please feel free to send an email to info at bellart.com. And uh, we hope to see you uh, online uh, for future uh, web sessions. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day.